News 5 Monday show for the 15th. Good evening. I'm Phil Wilson. And I'm Twyla Young. Welcome to Monday, a News 5 special report. Tonight we're going to look at the kinds of problems that declining enrollment is causing one rural school district in the state and what that, that school district is doing to combat those problems. We'll also be checking into Iowa State University's exercise clinic. Keeping in shape is in these days and we'll find out what's going on at the clinic and what's special about it. And we'll look at the phenomenon of self-service gasoline stations. There are more and more of them cropping up, and more and more full-service stations are going self-serve. We'll find out what's behind that and why people brave the cold to pump their own gasoline. Tonight on Bob Pyle's Notebook, we're going to visit one of the state's biggest tourist operations. Bob reports that in the rush to get the tourist dollar, the Amana colonies have lost much of their old world heritage. Many Amana residents realize this, and they're working on a plan to get some of that heritage back. Living in Iowa, all of us have heard of, at one time or another, the Amana colonies. These seven villages have gained the reputation of being one of the nation's biggest tourist attractions, drawing people from all over to visit their fine restaurants and pick up on quality handmade goods. The colonies didn't always cater to tourists. Originally, they were comprised of about 1,500 people who came to America from their native Germany to seek religious freedom from the Lutheran Church. They made the trip in 1844 and settled in a communal society near Buffalo, New York. But Buffalo was growing, so to escape the city, 10 years later, the group moved to eastern Iowa in search of space to let their religious community grow. have grown up from a communal society to a corporation handling more than 20 million dollars a year business but instead of the community being run by church elders the Amana society corporate board is now in charge divvying up the society's profits to its stockholders The Amana Society took over in the early 1930s. A depression was making the communal system unprofitable. About that time, Highway 6 and 149 were built through the colonies. This brought the outside world to Amana with people who were willing to pay a price for Amana goods. Originally, the woolen mill, which is still in existence, and the furniture shop and the meat markets and the bakeries, all produced products for use by the Amana people. And then there the, there came the time when there were surpluses, and then these surpluses were sold, and the people from without the community realized that the, the products that the Amana people did produce were very high in quality. So the Amana Church Society fell by the wayside to the Amana Society, which plays a dual role of being the spiritual leader of the community as well as the controllers of much of the business in the Amanas. The Amana Society has assumed the positions of what ordinarily would be the city council, uh, the city administration, mayor. Besides running the colony's government, the society also has complete control over all the production and sales of Amana furniture, foods, and woolen products. How does the society cope with combining business with the church? Uh, the visitors that come to Amana, that uh, frequent Amana society businesses, uh, get their money's worth. There's no attempt to mislead or, or defraud. And as long as, uh, as long as the society plays it on the up and up with the visitors to the amount of community, there, there is no problem with the church. The tourists we talked to didn't seem to have a problem with the society's combination of church and state. Well, we enjoy the food here. We come back two or three times a year and enjoy uh, good food. And then we always take home some bread and some sausage and maybe a bottle of wine and 
have a little uh, fun when we get back home, too. It's fun to bring relatives and friends over here. Well, it's an interesting place to go to. They have good food here, and uh, it's kind of going back into the old world, I guess, <laughs> seeing some of the things in the stores. To aid the tourist in spending his money, the board decided to expand the Amanas to outside the colony's limits. There is now a Little Amana, which is located on Interstate 80, and there's several Amana General Stores. Two of the general stores are located in the Des Moines area. These stores carry all the goods found in the Amana colonies, from handmade furniture to sweaters made out of Amana wool. The reason for that was that uh, we felt that the Amana community was, especially during the summer months, at a point of saturation from the standpoint of people flow. And for this reason, we decided to try to export Amana to the visitor instead of asking more visitors to come into the Amana area during a period of time when, when there is a problem accommodating uh, the large number of people that we see here. But not everyone's thrilled with the commercial growth of the Amanas. A group known as Our Hope for Our Community has recently been formed. The organization is comprised of younger residents of the colonies who fear increased commercialization of the Amana way of life. They want to take the colonies back to the ways of their ancestors. We contacted the group's spokesman, Guy Wendler. He refused to talk with us, saying it's the group's policy not to talk with news media. So with that, we went knocking door to door to find out how some of the residents feel about the colony's increased interest in the tourist dollar. Well, I really don't feel the effects of it during most of the year, but uh, most of the visitors are, are quite respectful of the property in Amana. Schaefer's house is a stone throw away from the beaten tourist path. His comments were common of many of the people we talked with in the colonies who feel the monetary profits made from tourism more than makes up for the hassles they cause. The society says they're also sensitive to the preservation of the old ways, and they say to prove it, they've conducted a study which suggests ways of restoring the colonies back to their original form. There are indications of the beginnings of a tourist trap, if you will. Uh, within the community, but it is not too late uh, to salvage the community and, and keep it genuine in effect. If the board approves the restoration project, Shoup says it'll not halt the commercial growth of the colonies. He says it'll just make new business architecture a little more compatible with the traditional Amana style. For Monday, this is Bob Pyle from Amana. And from the Amana colonies, we go to another rural part of the state. There's been a lot of concern lately about the financial problems that declining enrollment is causing public schools in this state. The amount of state aid available to schools is raised is based on the number of students in that school. When the number goes down, the money shrinks. Declining enrollment is a statewide problem, and it hits hard at large districts, but it threatens the very existence of small schools. Tonight, we're going to look at how one district, United Community School in Boone County, is dealing with the problem and how the people in that district feel about the changes. This year, United has about 400 students. In five years, it will have 300. The people here think they give their children a pretty good education, and they're eager to protect their school. Make a band go, you've got to use all the kids you have. You can't uh, say you can't be in the chorus if you're in the band, or you can't cheer and not be out for basketball, these sorts of things. So you have to develop plans that involve full use of all of your students. And consequently, we like to feel that they become a much uh, more well-rounded individual as a result of the variety of experiences rather than just being centered on maybe perhaps one thing that they show some talent in with at one particular time. And seeing them daily, they become individuals to us. It's much more possible for that to occur. Uh, then we can deal with them as individuals and talk with them about their things and when you only have uh, 200 customers to deal with as against a thousand why uh, there shouldn't be any reason why you couldn't get a little bit closer to those people the hard fact of life for united though is that fewer students make it more difficult to justify the number of teachers and the number of programs so the board and the administration have made a series of recommendations for next year that will change the way united looks some of the changes will actually expand programs. For instance, the librarian, who this year works only in the high school, will be able next year to spend time in the elementary school. Up until now, the library for the lower grades has been pretty much just kept up. 
but with fewer students needing the aid of a librarian in the high school, that faculty member can begin overseeing and developing the library for the elementary grades. The same arrangement will be possible for the art teacher. To better justify the personnel in these different areas, say art, we'd like to offer art as well as strengthening the elementary art program in these areas. It will draw some time uh, commitment away from the junior, senior high school art program, but we feel that this would be a better balancing out of, you know, by making such a move. But perhaps one of the most difficult changes will come in the elementary school, where some classrooms will be eliminated. United has always prided itself on its small classes and its low teacher-pupil ratio. This year, with 31 students in the third grade, United has two third grade classrooms, one with 15 students, one with 16. Next year, when these youngsters are in fourth grade, there will be one large classroom. The change may be defensible in terms of the financial situation and the educational needs of the group of children as a whole, but for many in this school community, it is a cause of concern. Ronald and Kay Santi have three children in the United Schools. Tammy, a freshman, a sixth grader, Sean, who will be part next year of a newly organized middle school instead of the more traditional junior high his sister was part of, and Shane, who this year is in a small third grade classroom and who is destined next year for a large fourth grade classroom. Obviously, given our preference, you know, we would like to see uh, the 16 to 1 ratio, 16 pupils per, per uh, teacher. Given the fact that we don't have adequate budget, uh, then we would need to look at what the alternatives are. And obviously, uh, staff is where the, uh, the biggest budgetary uh, consideration would be right now. I'm concerned about uh, the student who has trouble, in a, and I feel that he would have more trouble in a larger class. And uh, one of the proposals is to have a teacher's aide, so I'm hoping that that would definitely help the class that is larger. The problems facing United Community Schools are not unique to this district, and the solutions being proposed here represent the same kind of hard decisions that are facing districts all over the state. Uh, with the uh, appreciating costs of fuel oil, salaries, uh, uh, Social Security, etc., uh, textbooks, uh, they become very attuned to the need to critically analyze the budgets and assess uh, when you're talking students, teachers, the ratios, the relationships, uh, when you're talking programs, uh, the need versus, you know, another need, uh, whether you're going to allow us to fund one program or another. Uh, I think the budgetary limitations, yes, it's, it's of great concern to us, but I guess that uh, our own feeling is that we're both optimistic uh, about where this school is going, the potential. Uh, I think we have to be certain we do the very best with the resources uh, that we have. Although the problems here are enormous, there is a vitality in these small schools, a sense of community. The people who live here and work here believe in the value of their kind of education and their ability to make it survive. The folks at United have already had one meeting concerning the uh, problems and recommendations that's been made, and I'm sure they're going to have several more, at least a lot more discussion before those recommendations are put into effect next year. You think it's likely we're going to see similar meetings throughout the state coming up? I don't think there's any doubt about it because it's a problem that's, that's facing schools all over the state. Well, coming up next, Phil is going to take a very personal look at the Iowa State University Exercise Clinic and a special test they have there to tell you how well your body works.
According to legend, when someone once asked the author Mark Twain if he ever did physical exercise, Twain replied, no, I never saw any profit in getting tired. Well, some people share those sentiments, but many others do not. They're enrolling in regular exercise programs. Mark Twain probably wouldn't like our next story, but we hope you will. For years they've been telling us we eat too much, drink too much, watch TV too much, and get too little exercise. They say we become thick-bodied, full-buttocked, and pot-gutted. Well, that may be changing. Millions of Americans have taken up jogging, and others, like these folks, have begun rigorous exercise programs. <laughs> <laughs> These are some of the 110 people who have joined an exercise clinic at Iowa State University. They come here three times a week for an hour-long workout. Their progress is charted in 10-week intervals. The head of the program is Dr. Wallace Hutchison. We teach the uh, participants the exercises, and then once we have taught them the exercises and we have given them their program, then the, we are here to supervise that, to see that they're doing the exercises correctly, and also to make any changes that we deem necessary as they are exercising. Uh, and then in the exercise program, then they progressively over a 10-week period increase the uh, various exercises and also increase the jogging so that they can reach as high a level in 10 weeks as, as we can get them. But rigorous exercise is not for everyone, especially for older folks. In this case, meaning anyone over 35. There's a danger in over-exercising from some people, and that's one of the reasons why we give the test. If they go out and start to exercising, and they, are not, uh, they don't know what tolerance they can uh, uh, withstand, then they may then uh, initiate uh, a cardiac arrest. To guard against such a possibility, people 35 or older are subjected to what is called a stress test. It involves walking and running on a treadmill as the speed and steepness of angle steadily increase. What we're seeing is can the cardiovascular system tolerate this exercise that we're asking it to do. Now many times in a resting state, we're not asking you know, the heart to really uh, perform a lot of work. But if we're going to have someone exercise and exercise close to their maximal effort, then we want to be able to determine if they can handle that. Since this reporter is among the overfed and under-exercised, we decided to try the stress test. In this case, it began with having a part of the chest shaved and then being fitted with a series of electrodes. I feel we're going to hook you up here now. Right arm. Okay. Right arm. All right. Right leg. Uh -huh. Is this the, wire, the way they wire them when they electrocute them in Sing Sing? And Not really. Okay. Not really. <sighs> you can just stand up now. <clears throat> they use a head room. Uh -huh. We better not have any electricity coming in here. I'm not sure the public is ready for the displaying of this alabaster frail body. You're not, huh? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it is blood pressure. 82 on a standing, 71 at rest. And with that, it was on to the treadmill. At the start, the treadmill is level and moving at a moderate pace. It will get worse. Every three minutes, it will increase the workload by increasing the treadmill slightly. Every three minutes? Every three minutes. And I'm also not sure the I speed. I do this more than three minutes. <laughs> well, we'll see. See, that heart rate's gone up. Yeah, that's what it should do. With an increase in workload, we'd break you up. If we didn't, we'd be concerned. The same way with the systolic blood pressure. I need to take your blood pressure again now. Okay, 196 over 90. Well, we got you stepping out there now. Yeah. Right now on the monitor, we're monitoring the limb leads, one, two, and three. Now we can switch to the augmented leads, AVR, AVL, and AVF. If we want to, then we can monitor the uh, three leads on the chest, V1, V2, and V3. And then if we want to see V4, and V5, and V6, we can just switch it there. It's gonna increase the workload. Huh. Increase the speed and the elevation here now. This will make you really step out there. If you feel more comfortable jogging, you can go ahead and jog. No. 
Okay. That's just kind of in between a walk and a jog. Now, how are you feeling? A little tired. Any little tired? Can you go another minute? Yeah. Okay. We got you up to 170 now. It's about where we want you to be. A minute up. Not quite. <laughs> Do you want to go another minute? No. <laughs> okay. We'll stop it now. Ooh. Ah. Now let me take your blood pressure, we'll take you off the treadmill, we'll start it back again, slow it down, then we'll have you walk for five minutes recovery period. Uh -huh. As if this weren't enough, a further fitness test involves a device to check grip strength and a stationary bicycle tests endurance. These are not fun. Squeeze it hard. Harder, 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 harder. That's it, that's it, harder. All right, relax. Seconds. All of this prepared us for the exercise period the next day. After a 10 minute series of warm up exercises, we get into the heavy stuff. Better roll early because I'm not going to do many of these. this was going on, some of the exercise class talked about what they were getting from the program. A lot of sore muscles right now. No, actually, I'm getting in pretty good shape. I'm probably in the best shape I've been in since I left high school. Uh, I feel better when I exercise. Keeping in shape, you know, trying to keep from getting older, I guess. And uh, lose a little weight. Get me a little bit back in shape for softball, whatever, this spring. Well, hopefully it's bodybuilding, but also <laughs> concerned about the condition of the heart. And keeping the heart in good shape, heart muscle. Physical fitness and uh, weight control and uh, energy. Oh, it's increased my stamina and my endurance and lung capacity is better. My heart, I think, is in better shape. If you'd like to get more information about this program, you can call Iowa State University Gym. I'll tell you more about it. The address and phone number. But frankly, I'm too tired. <sighs> well, just one added thought about that. The people we talked with in the class seemed to sum up their thoughts by saying that exercise makes you feel better, look better, and in fact, you are better. We'll let you catch your breath now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you pump your own gasoline or do you let someone else pump it for you? Well, if you still let someone else pump it for you, you're in the majority. About 60% of the gasoline brought into this country, uh, come, bought in this country, comes from full service stations. But it may not be true for very much longer. According to the Iowa Gasoline Dealers Association, by the mid-1980s, three-quarters of the gasoline pumped in service stations will be pumped by the people buying it. And that means that full-service stations are either going to have to close or change their style. Well, I think basically to summarize it, it, it would probably be survival of the fittest. It's not a bleak outlook, by all means. But the major thing that I think service station operations managers have to get out of the back room, get into the books, and become a manager. We have to become that good manager and present ourselves image-wise and credibility-wise open to the public and not pump jockeys as everybody thinks we are. 
Generally speaking, most full-service stations are franchised by an oil company, and most self-service stations are not. Says Blixt, that's part of the problem. The problem you get into when you talk about independent operation versus a full-service station operation, the full-service station operation is not able to buy surplus product from a major refinery. Uh, he's locked into a supplier, uh, and so what basically happens is the suppress of the market, uh, gas prices go down. Now, that's good for the consumer. I don't blame anybody for that. But the problem is we have one segment of the business that can buy surplus product and another segment that cannot. But we thought we'd take an unscientific sample ourselves to find out why folks buy one or the other. Can I ask you why you pump your own gas, especially in weather like this? Save money. Any other reason? No. Okay. Can you tell me why you come to a full-service pump when self-serve gas is cheaper? I usually uh, go to the self-service, but it's too cold. <laughs> so I went to full-service. Can I ask you why you buy your, your gas at a full-service pump when self-service is cheaper? Because it's cold out today. <laughs> do you, in the, in the summertime when it's warmer, do you buy a full-service self-serve? Uh, most of the time, self-serve. So, you, so your main reason is the weather. Right. If it's cold and, or it's raining or something, I go to full service. But the cold weather alone is not enough to discourage some people from pumping their own gas. Can you tell me why you pump your own gas in such cold weather? Well, because I travel for my business and it saves me a few extra pennies. And every penny I save, uh, you know, it's more money in my pocket. Can I ask you why you buy your gas at a self-service station, especially in weather like this? Well, cheaper for one thing. It's a lot cheaper. Any other reason? No, that's about it. Can you tell me why you buy your gas at a full service station instead of self-serve? Because they check the oil once in a while. Look under the hood and see if there's a battery left in the car. You like that part about it, huh? Well, yeah. I've, if I'm going to fill self-service, I'll fill out my own barrel at home. I'm 200 miles from home and I let somebody else worry about it. I'll be, I'll be willing to bet that there are going to be lots of, at least a few self uh, full service stations and customers for them as long as Iowa has cold winters. And especially when it's 10 below zero, <laughs> one of those customers will be me. I think I may be there with you. Well, that's Monday for this evening. We'll be back February 5 with a look at the popularity of what is sometimes called classical music, sometimes called serious music, and what is often called these days at least big business. Bob Pyle's looking into that situation, and he'll have a musical report for us. And we'll also be looking into special problems and circumstances of teenagers who become parents. There are some startling figures about the number of young people who are having children before they finish high school. And we'll examine genetic counseling, what it is and how it can help prospective parents. Many people are afflicted by genetic disease, those are disorders that they inherit from their parents, whether their parents had that disease or not. So be sure to join us in three weeks for that program. I'm Twyla Young. And I'm Phil Wilson. Thank you, and good night. <laughs> Oh, I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>